Hi, I'm Tova Hellerstein, and I'm joined today by Emily Hawthorne, and we're looking at the political crisis in Baghdad and the ongoing protests there. And we can see a lot of this through satellite imagery. So what do you make of the satellite imagery showing the protest activity that's currently underway in Baghdad? So we have this satellite imagery, which is from Tuesday, April 26th in Baghdad, downtown Baghdad. And this is really just a snapshot of many of the protests that have been ongoing in Baghdad and throughout Iraq over the past weeks, months. Really, we can take it as far back as when the current prime minister, Haider al-Abadi, took office in 2014. He promised from the very beginning anti-corruption reforms, and he promised a more efficient government that was more responsive to Iraqis' needs. He's had a lot of difficulty putting that in place. So we've seen a lot of protests. Um, this imagery in particular is of a Muqtada Sadr-led protest. Um, he is a uh, Shiite cleric who is able to galvanize a lot of Iraqi support behind him from primarily Shiite poor support base. But really, he's he's capturing a lot of a general Iraqi uh, frustration against the government and against inefficiency. So this this satellite in particular shows protests which began on Tuesday that were timed with the prime minister seeking to put in some new ministers that were better qualified and less tied to particular sects and particular parties. Um, this is not going particularly well. So you can see in this imagery that there are a lot of Iraqis that are still very upset about the stalemate going on in the government. Right, because Prime Minister Abadi had promised these different reforms and you know it's really difficult to put in a technocratic cabinet when you have so many political parties with their entrenched interests that don't really want to give up their patronage networks. And so he's right. really struggling with this. And yeah, so Sutter, when he, I remember when he first started these protests, he was really, he did a really good job of capitalizing on that just widespread sentiment that the prime minister was not doing an efficient job in these mm -hmm. reforms. Um, and the, when we look at the imagery, I mean, we're looking at 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 protesters. When right. we look at the density um, of, of per, per square foot there, and, you know, this is only in Baghdad, and this is only Sutter supporters, so this is really, you know, this is not yeah. even including the broader decision satisfaction with a buddy. Right. So when we look at Sadr, I mean, how would you characterize his role in Iraqi politics? So most people still remember him from when he was a militia leader when um, the Americans intervened in Iraq in 2003, when he was really a key force in fighting the coalition forces. And, you know, he had Mahdi army, which he's disbanded, but now there's a new militia associated with Sadr called Saraya um, Brigades, Peace Brigades. And so Sadr is now not only an important militia leader with, we estimate, around 20 20,000 members of this militia, but he's an important political player. He has a couple dozen uh, deputies within his own political bloc, the Ahrar bloc, in the Iraqi parliament. And while that's not an incredible amount given the the scope of how many deputies are in the Iraqi parliament, mm -hmm. they're far more cohesive of a bloc than most of these other blocs. And so he's a really important political leader. He's been incredibly successful in galvanizing protests in order to insist on technocratic reforms from the Abadi administration. And what we see is when he insists on these different reforms and Abadi uh, says he will do them, he calls off his protests. And when Abadi does not follow through, he calls them on again. And that power right. is just, it's so rare in Iraqi politics to be able to galvanize people so quickly. And that's why when we look at this imagery, it's really significant that he's able to really quickly with this quick turnaround galvanize such enormous amounts of people and that's right. why we were so concerned when there was a breach in that in the green zone right just because a few days later just a right. few days later and he definitely has a, a degree of political interest himself i mean he wants this type of political power in baghdad as well so i think Sadr is a is a great way to look at other sort of outside influence into iraq absolutely because he's one of the few who's more of an independent actor mm -hmm. whereas a lot of these other parties and political leaders within the shiite leadership in iraq Iraq are more pro-Iranian influence than pro-Iraqi nationalism. And we actually right. see this big spectrum, right, where Prime Minister Abadi is a little bit more pro-Iraqi um, nationalist and some other leaders are more pro-Iranian influence. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's really interesting, right, to look at this spectrum. I mean, what's your take on the Iranian influence in Iraqi politics today? Right. I think Sadr is a, a fascinating lens to use to look at Iranian influence in Iraq because Yes, he is an independent actor, but definitely having trained in Iran, having uh, having many, uh, you know, he has a relationship with the Iranian government in so much as they've supported his militias over time. Um, 
he is more Iran leaning than uh, U.S. Or, or Western leaning by far, but he still is one of those characters that is able to conduct some of his own affairs. Um, now, when we're thinking about Iranian influence in Iraq in general, um, it's uh, you can take it as far back as many centuries when these two Shia majority countries have have had a lot of religious exchange, historical exchange over centuries. But we also see if we take it more to the present and we look at 2003, 2004, when there was a degree of a, of a vacuum in Baghdad over power and we had the beginnings of that system that's preserved uh, Shia uh, interest um, as a majority in the Baghdad government and then Sunni and Kurdish interests as well. Um, Iran saw an opportunity to bolster its influence, um, to support various militias, um, as well as to support political parties, political parties like the Dawa Party, political parties um, like the Islamic uh, Council in Iraq. Yeah, these, right. are, these are incredibly important political leaders that Iran supports. Right. And when we look at Iranian influence, there's a lot of interest in Iraq right now and on this political stalemate because of the fight against the Islamic State. So how would you characterize Iranian influence in so much as it affects that fight? Yeah, so I mean, you have the Iraqi security forces, so you have a military within Iraq, but they actually really heavily rely on these different militias that are predominantly Shiite militias that mm -hmm. are very much supported by Iran. Um, and that, that support and the mobilization of these Shiite militias actually goes back about a decade, but these militias were formally put under the Interior Ministry a couple of years ago. And so even though they're under the Interior Ministry, they work mm -hmm. officially within the parameters of the Iraqi government, they very much uh, take their cues and large part from Iran. A lot of that funding still comes from Iran. So when we look at the pivotal role that these Shiite militias are playing mm -hmm. in the anti-Islamic state operations, certainly as we go up further north, you know, it really begs the question of what happens when those operations are over? What happens about um, those Iranian um, associated militias? You know, how much influence will they yield on behalf of Iran in, in the future? And what does that mean about Baghdad politics going forward? Right. And I, and I think that takes us back to the satellite imagery where we see that this is a very critical time for Baghdad. We see a lot of public anger against the stalemate. Um, and I think that this merits a lot of really close watch moving forward. Absolutely. Um, for more on Baghdad politics, um, visit Stratfor.com.